Good morning in North America, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Bruce Tatters, CEO at Red Cloud Securities, Inc. Today's webinar features Seabridge Gold, the premier gold and copper explorer development companies that exist in the world today. It also is one of the few companies in extremely politically secure regions of Canada and the U.S. Seabridge ranks as first in gold reserves per share, first in gold resources per share among all North American listed gold companies. We're extremely privileged to have Seabridge here today to update everyone following their new pre-feasibility study on its KSM project, which includes the addition of the Snowfield acquisition in 2021. I have Rudy Franck, co-founder, chairman, and CEO, who will provide an update to investors today on Seabridge plan, Seabridge's plans for the balance of 2022. I'd also mention that despite Jim Anthony not joining us for a talk on gold, his most recent commentary is available on Seabridge's website for all those to take a look at. Uh, we missed having Jim today, but I'm sure we'll get him back sh soon in, uh, in a follow-up call. After formal presentations, we will take questions live. Please send us your questions via chat, and we'll get to as many of them as you can. You can type in your questions in the chat box at any time. To start, we'll handle the disclosures and then get right to it. For Seabridge, there may be some forward-looking statements made on this call. I would direct listeners to the cautionary note on page two of the corporate presentation. For Red Cloud, I'd highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only and should not be considered a solicitation for purchase or sales of securities or a specific recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note that this call does not consider the particular situations or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. Please see our most recent research located on our website for Seabridge Gold for specific disclosures. And so now I'll turn it over to Rudy for him to begin. Uh, thank you, Bruce, and uh, thanks everybody for taking some time this morning to uh, hear the updated Seabridge story. We've had a lot going on here over the past several months, and today I'd like to concentrate on two things. Number one is the uh, substantially started activities we're now undertaking at KSM to ensure that our permits and approvals stay good for the life of the project. And secondly, just a little over a week ago, we announced the updated results from a new pre-feasibility study at KSM that shows a much uh, improved project in terms of financial returns, but also a de-risk project in terms of a development. And just a reminder, like Bruce said, I, I will likely be making forward-looking statements during this presentation. So the case for Seabridge is looking big picture. Uh, we've got a 23-year track record of showing significant outperformance in our share price relative to gold and copper prices. The fact of the matter is, because of our leading ounces of gold in the ground per common share or a leading copper in the ground per common share. Uh, we provide the best optionality and leverage to both gold and copper. We also are sitting here today with 100% ownership in the world's largest undeveloped gold and copper project, namely KSM, that is not only large, but as I'll walk you through some slides today, shows tremendous financial returns at current and, and even lower metal prices. Uh, where we've done our best though over the years is finding gold. Uh, in 2015, when the gold price bottomed again after hitting 1900 in 2011, down to 1050 in 2015, we again took advantage of a down market and went out and purchased three earlier stage exploration projects that were now advancing through exploration activities. We believe that any one of these projects in itself could be a company maker. If I have to use one slide to tell the company's history, this is what it would be. Uh, Jim Anthony and I took over the shell in 1999. At the time, Seabridge had about 17 million shares outstanding, $200,000 cash in the bank, and had a 10 cent share price. Our stated objective from then, which is still true today, is to try and build the industry's best leverage play to rising gold prices. And the way we've accomplished that is through the idea of growing ounces in the ground faster than shares outstanding. I think we all have come accustomed to how dilutive our industry can be in terms of issuing share after share after share without offsetting that dilution with real value. Everything we do from engineering, acquisitions, and exploration 
is geared to growing ounces in the ground. And it's not just in terms of quantity, it's also to improve the quality of those ounces by upgrading lower resource categories to higher resource categories and eventually into reserves. And as you can see on this chart, we have delivered on that concept. At the end of the, the second quarter of this year, we had about 170 million ounces in total gold resources and a little over 80 million shares outstanding. That's about two ounces of gold in the ground per common share. And these numbers exclude the 54 billion pounds of copper we also hold and the over 800 million ounces of silver that part of, are part of our resources. So as Bruce mentioned, when you look at us relative to the industry, nobody comes close to us in terms of the concept of ounces of gold in the ground per common share. As you can see here, we provide five to 50 times more gold ownership per common share than the leading gold companies uh, in our space. And what this has translated into is what we were hoping for, and that's significant outperformance in our share price relative to the price of gold and to other gold equities. Uh, I'm always amazed looking at this chart here to see how poorly the larger gold companies, which tend to be the go-to stocks in our space, uh, you look at examples like uh, like Nigo Eagle, uh, Newman, Barrick, Yamana, Kinross, Anglo Gold, you are better off owning physical gold over the long term versus shares in these in these in these larger companies. People invest in gold stocks with the expectation in a rising gold price environment, the share price should outperform the gold price. We've delivered that in spades for the past 23 years. The fact is, if the price of gold is going higher, which we believe it will over the over the next period of time, owning Seabridge common shares is a good way to get that exposure and that leverage and optionality to higher gold prices. And it's not just about gold. We also found a lot of copper along the way, uh, not by design. The copper came along with the exploration success we had at KSM. Uh, we have over 50 billion pounds of copper now in all resource categories, uh, over 7 billion pounds of copper reserves. So if you look at Seabridge from the copper perspective and ignore the gold and the silver, you can see here that we provide more ownership of, of copper per share in terms of reserves or resources than the leading copper companies. And as why is that important? As bullish as we are on gold, we remain bullish on copper as well. The fact is the world needs a lot more copper in the future to satisfy the, the demands of green energy initiatives. And I can tell you firsthand that a lot of new copper mines are not getting permitted today. The challenges you face in terms of getting large projects permitted uh, are pretty consistent around the world. So we believe as a result of that, supply will not keep up with demand. And as a result, we expect to see higher copper prices as well. Uh, turning now to KSM, where we'll spend the balance of this presentation on, uh, KSM is a project we acquired from Placer Dome in June of 2000. Placer Dome had spent about $25 million at KSM, defining two deposits, the Kerr deposit and the Sulphurets deposit, where they calculated a resource of about 3 million ounces of gold um, and, uh, just, uh, and just over 2 billion pounds of copper. If you fast forward to today, we've now spent over $500 million Canadian in shareholder money to advance KSM, uh, not only to what is now the largest undeveloped gold and copper project in the world, but a project that has tremendous financial uh, um, numbers associated with it, a project that has successfully gone through the environmental assessment process with permits in hand, and a project that has the support of the large indigenous populations that, that are impacted by the KSM project. When we bought this project in June of 2000, where it's an area called the Golden Triangle, the only other activity in the area was the old SK Creek mine that Barrick was operating at that time as a high-grade underground mine. A lot has changed in uh, this part of British Columbia. We now see tremendous interest in this area. The majors are showing up, uh, buying into projects or buying companies. Examples of that would be uh, Newcrest coming in and buying 70% of the Red Chris mine for $875 million in cash a few years ago. And then just more recently buying uh, Redium Resources uh, for cash and shares totaling about $2.8 billion. We also have Newmont in the area now, first buying a 50% interest in the Galore Creek project just to the north of KSM. And then more recently buying a GT Gold uh, for cash. Uh, there's nothing out there at the in the Golden Triangle that comes close to KSM in terms of size, capital efficiency, and longevity of a project. 
when we bought this project from Placer Dome, there really was not a lot going on in terms of logistical opportunities in the area. It was a very isolated project. If you fast forward to today, through the investment by the Canadian government and other independent parties, we now have a lot of infrastructure that's required for projects the scale of KSM. First, we have a major highway just to the east of KSM, Highway 37. That's now a year-round paved highway that provides access uh, down to uh, the Port of Stewart. We also, along that highway, the Government of Canada has extended the power grid, bringing cheap uh, green power, hydropower to the region. Uh, they spent over $700 million extending the grid without having any buyers lined up yet with the expectation that over time, with this infrastructure there, that it would attract investment, which clearly it has now. We've now secured with BC Hydro 245 of megawatts of power from this line that we'll be able to buy at current tariff rates of about five cents US per kilowatt hour, some of the cheapest power in the world. We've actually now are working with BC Hydro, signed another contract with them, and they are building a switching station for us that'll provide us power for construction activities at KSM off the line. And then last but not least, just to the south of us in the town of Stewart, uh, we have a, a port facility that's been rehabilitated that is now serving the Red Chris mine and a brand new port facility that's recently been built that's looking for an anchor tenant. The ability to bring supplies in by ship and take concentrate out to smelters on the Pacific Rim definitely does set KSM apart from other projects. In fact, if you look at some of these other projects around the world, the infrastructure costs we're saving here, not having to build power plants or ports or roads for that matter, or at least major Highway 37, is we're probably saving well above a billion dollars that does not have to be spent. Whereas other projects around the world that are in the development stage, they need to bring that in. We received our environmental approvals in uh, in June of 2014 from the from the from the provincial government and uh, December of 2014 from the um, from from the Canadian government. Those approvals were originally good for 10 years, meaning they would have expired in 2024. As a result of COVID, we went out and got another two years on these permits, meaning that our environmental assessment certificates now and permits we have in place are good till July of 2026. As we've talked through potential joint venture structures with potential partners at KSM, which is our plan going forward, you know, one of the risks that you face there was these permits perhaps eventually expiring either in 2024 or now in 2026. So about a year ago, we decided to take on the, the commitment to move the project forward just to uh, obtain what's known as a substantially started designation. And what that does for us with substantially started approved, it means that the permits don't expire in 2020, so 2026. In fact, they would be good for the life of the project, which in our case uh, goes on for decades. So uh, we started this process last year. Uh, it involves building roads, building camps, building fish compensation areas, um, tying into the grid with BC Hydro. Uh, now, we also recognize that this is an expensive undertaking for the company. In fact, between this year and next year, we're estimating to spend about $300 million Canadian on substantially started activities big nut to fill in terms of a company that doesn't have any other revenues at this point in time. So we looked at more traditional ways to finance this. We looked at equity financings, would have resulted in about 17% dilution at the then share prices we, were, we had. So we decided to get a bit more creative on this and actually use the project itself to fund these activities without diluting our shareholders at the equity level. We were able to obtain 225 million US uh, which is about $300 million Canadian at today's exchange rate through a transaction we did with uh, Sprout Royalties and our Terry Teachers Pension Plan. Um, they put the money in the company. We're now spending it. And I've got a bunch of photos here to show you as we go forward in the work we're doing. But this ensures that we have the financing in place to get to a point where we'll be comfortable filing for substantially started activities. Um, the, the structure of the deal is, is it's a note, it's a, it's a dead instrument that will automatically convert into a silver royalty at KSM, covering 60% of the silver production at the point of commercial production. Now you say, okay, 60% of the silver is a lot. When you actually look at the revenues though, silver and the new mine plan represents uh, below 3% of the project's revenues. 
So 60% of the silver content that comes through as revenues is about a one and a half percent charge against the project. Far less dilutive than doing an equity deal and taking it on the project itself to essentially finance itself. I'll show you some pictures here in terms of the activities. As I said, we started these activities a little over a year ago. We do have one major uh, river crossing here across the Bell Irving River. Uh, it actually is the, is the this will be our access road that ties into Highway 37. Uh, you can see here, we actually have the temporary bridge set up because you need to actually only work on these bridges during certain times of the year based on water flow and fish flow. Uh, we got the temporary bridge up and we're now in the process of uh, building the permanent bridge uh, that'll be there for the life of the project. And here's a more recent photo where you start to see some of the steel girders going in across the river that'll go from both sides. Another picture of the uh, the bridge here showing the abutments that were put in place uh, to ensure obviously that there's very little impact on, on the river flow here. So we have two large abutments that go across here and it'll be connected from both sides. As I said, we're also doing a lot of work on camp construction. Uh, camp 11 is a camp that is uh, just off of Highway 37. In fact, when you go across the bridge, this is the first major camp. Uh, starting the earthworks on this uh, as early as last year. And now we actually are building the permanent camp there. But to build a permanent camp, you need to actually provide a uh, camp space for your employees that are doing the permanent camp. So you can see in this photo here, we have a temporary camp that's now been put in place to house the people that are now working on the permanent camp. Uh, we expect to have beds ready for the permanent camp within the next uh, month or two. Um, one of the big uh, things you have to deal with uh, in British Columbia in particular is uh, fish compensation. Under Canadian law, you're not allowed to destroy fish habitat. However, there is a way that you can get a, a change in the law known as a Schedule II amendment that allows you to destroy fish habitat provided that you actually rebuild new fish habitat to offset what you're destroying. We now are in the process of building our first fish habitat site known as Glacier Creek. You can see this here. A um, little closer, closer look also. Um, you know, obviously for a lot of this construction work, we also need to have a lot of material for, uh, for base of camps and also for road aggregate. Um, we said our geologists a couple of years ago, okay, guys, you've been great at finding mineralization. We now need you to find rock that's not mineralized that we can use for uh, bases for roads and, uh, and camp foundations. So they went out and uh, actually found uh, a lot of material at different uh, gravel sites we'll be using that will allow us to provide all the uh, gravels we're going to need for construction activities. To do this work, we need to bring a lot of equipment in. Um, obviously, we don't have road access to the site right now. So here's a picture of some of the larger equipment that's coming in from our contractors that are actually doing the work coming in by barge uh, from Vancouver Island. Uh, then we need to helicopter lift and a heavy, heavy helicopter lift that equipment into site. Here's a picture of a, a beautiful picture showing the heavy lift helicopter that came in and a closer look of the heli lift up, hel helicopter. Uh, once you get the pieces back on the ground that were taken apart before you can fly it in, you then need to put it back together again. And here's a photo of uh, some, some track equipment uh, being put back together again, as well as some of the trucks that need to be taken apart that were then reassembled at site and are now active doing the work. Uh, one final photo here, uh, the big camp we'll have will actually be on the mine side of the operation in uh, Mitchell Valley. Here you can see Camp 9 in early June. Uh, this is a camp that will, hose, that will house a lot of employees, not only during construction, but also during operations. And here again, just doing the, uh, um, you know, the base of the camp in terms of the pad prep preparation for this Camp 9 in the Mitchell Valley. Another big part is uh, coming in with an access road off of Highway 37 that'll connect the, uh, uh, this will be the main haul road to take concentrate out and supplies into the mill. Uh, we are now building this road uh, along the Treaty Creek access. Uh, this is an important uh, permanent road that'll be used for the life of the project. So getting back more specifics on the project and why we think this will become one of the largest mines ever built in the, in the world. Uh, if you look at the project we have today, we are blessed with five deposits. To call this a project really does it injustice. This is a district. If you look around the world, a project like KSM would be separated 
amongst a number of companies, each having their own deposit or two. We have 100% of all five of these deposits. When we bought this project from Placer Dome, the Kerr and the Sulphurettes deposit were known. We found Mitchell in 2006. We found Iron Cap in 2010. And as Bruce mentioned, we purchased East Mitchell, which was formerly called Snowfield, from our next door neighbor, Predium, in December of 2020 for $100 million in cash. We recently did an updated resource estimate based on additional drilling we did last year at East Mitchell and Mitchell. That'll be the focus of the new mine plan going in. Uh, we now capture 11 billion tons of economic resources within these five deposits that yield over 150 million ounces of gold, over 54 billion pounds of copper, and over 800 million ounces of silver. Oh, and also a lot of molybdenum as well, over seven, over almost 800 almost uh, 1.2 billion pounds of molybdenum. When we went through the environmental assessment process, however, we're only permitted for about 2.3 billion tons of tailings. So although we have uh, 11 billion tons of economic resources amongst our five deposits here, we have been focusing our mine plans over time. What is the best 2.3 billion tons of material that can be mined first to generate the best projects economics? We did a pre-fees in 2012 that focused on Iron Cap, Mitchell, Sulfurets, and Kerr, which were the four deposits we had at that point in time. That pre-feasibility study in 2012 was what we used to get our permits. We received the environmental approvals in 2014. And then in 2016, we updated the pre-feasibility study to incorporate changes we made during the environmental assessment process, as well as um, <clears throat> changing metal prices and exchange rates. With the addition of East Mitchell, though, we did a further iteration, which was just announced a few weeks ago, showing a much improved project by bringing East Mitchell into the project mix and still limiting our total throughput to the 2.3 billion tons that we have approved. I'm now going to run through some slides to show the improvements uh, that we see at the project now as a result of the updated study incorporating East Mitchell. First and foremost, I think we'd like to point out here that the metal prices that we use to define reserves are quite low. In fact, the metal prices we used in the 2016 study and the 2022 study are actually below a lot of the major gold companies that they use for their reserve delineation. <clears throat> the big change as a result of bringing East Mitchell in is actually a significant increase in our gold reserves. Our gold reserves grew from 38.8 million ounces in the 2016 study to 47.3 million ounces. And that's a result of actually mining higher grade gold that exists at the East Mitchell deposit versus what we had previously. By going more at East Mitchell, we can now show a project that's open pit only. We do lose a little copper there and, and silver there, but again, offsetting that is the, is the increase in, uh, in gold prices, uh, sorry, in, in gold reserves. In terms of production, uh, we actually have designed in a 50% a, a increase in the production now in the new mine plan that basically starts to kick in with the work in the first year of operation and having the 195,000 ton per day throughput available to us sometime in year three. <clears throat> As you can see in the slide here now, whereas the 2016 study included op, uh, production from both open pits and underground block caves, we're now going open pit only. I think what's remarkable on this is if you looked at the 2016 study with 1.5 billion tons of material coming from open pits, it, uh, you had to mine about 3 billion tons of waste. So from the open pit material, you basically had a two to one strip ratio, two tons of waste move for every ton of ore taken out from open pits. As a result of ridiculously low strip ratios at East Mitchell, we actually now show a, a, a mine plan here that has a strip ratio of about one to one. Uh, pretty remarkable compared to uh, projects around the world. In fact, one of the lowest strip ratios I've ever seen on a project of this scale. We also will be producing a lot more metal. We have a 33-year mine plan here now at KSM that'll average over 1 million ounces of gold production a year over the 33 years. And even as a result of uh, lower, copper, uh, lower copper reserves coming in, we actually have an increase in copper production and silver production compared to the 2016 study as a result of the increased capacity. Uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a mine anywhere around the world that can produce this much metal in a given year, uh, let alone one that has a 33 year mine life. 
and still has another 8 billion tons of resources still left in the ground that can be developed uh, after this initial mine plan is exhausted. In terms of costs, uh, I think uh, we all recognize that the Fed completely had it wrong. Inflation is not transitory, it's here to stay. So the design we did in the 2022 study was actually focused on trying to keep capital costs at a reasonable level, knowing that we're gonna be impacted by inflation. Uh, there is an impact in terms of the initial capital, uh, obviously as a result of steel costs, cement costs, and labor costs. The upfront capital went from $5 billion in 2016 to $6.4 billion in the new study. However, the sustaining capital has come down dramatically by over $3 billion, uh, by over $2 billion as a result of not having to develop those um, capital intensive block caves like we had in previous mine plans. So you can see here, the life of mine capital costs has actually been reduced from 10.5 billion in the previous study to 9.6 billion in the new study over the 33 year mine life. Also looking at unit operating costs as a result of eliminating the block cave mining that has higher unit costs and also as a result of the increase in the throughput from economies of scale, our unit operating costs actually dropped from 2016 to 2022 by about a dollar from 12.36 US per ton to mill to about 11.36 per ton. But the biggest impact is in the economics. Uh, here's a side-by-side -side comparison showing the results of the 2016 study compared to the results in the 2022 study. We've been very consistent in our analysis over the years that when we look at a new mine plan, the metal prices we use are the three-year average over the preceding three years. So you see the price deck that was used in 2016 versus the price deck that was used in 2022. What jumps out at you are a number of things. First and foremost is the increase in net present value going from 1.5 billion on an after-tax basis to nearly $8 billion today. Also looking at the internal rate of return more than doubling from 8% to 16%. And also probably more significant to any of that is how quick do you get your money back once this project is built. And as you can see here, uh, the payback period has dropped from over six years to just under four years. This is a project that also will be able to show very low on the, on the, on the cost, um, on the cost curve for the industry. We're looking at an all in cost of production, including all of the upfront capital all of the sustaining capital, all of the closure costs, all of the reclamation costs, all of the operating costs, net of copper, silver, and molly credits of about $600 an ounce. So at today's metal prices, you're looking at over a $1,000 margin on an all-in basis. And then if you look at it on just an operating cost basis, uh, which excludes capital, just what is your average operating cost per year, it averages about $275 an ounce uh, for gold produced. So clearly a project that has improved dramatically, not just from a, um, a development scenario by removing the block caves, but from a financial perspective, uh, show me another project around the world today that can reduce this much metal and generate an after-tax NPV of uh, nearly $8 billion. And then of course, looking at the project in terms of uh, lower metal prices and higher metal prices to show that even at lower metal prices using $1,500 gold and $3 copper, a project that still generates reasonable returns uh, and a lot of cash flow at lower metal prices. So before we go to Q&A, just to kind of sum things up on why I believe um, owning Seabridge shares makes sense today. In fact, I've got over 90% of my net worth uh, in Seabridge common shares. First and foremost is uh, our leverage we have to gold and copper. We are bullish on both metals going forward. If you want exposure to higher gold, prices or higher copper prices, look no further than Seabridge. Secondly, we own 100% of the world's largest undeveloped gold and copper project in a safe jurisdiction that has successfully gone through the permitting process and is now starting early site construction with our substantially started activities in a world where more large projects are needed. The elephant in the room in the gold space is that our gold industry is running out of reserves. Uh, the major companies today have probably the shortest reserve life left in the 40 years I've been in the business, and the copper companies today need new copper mines to satisfy the demand going forward that's going to result from the green energy initiatives. 
I didn't even touch on exploration here today, but rest assured that's some that's a skill set where we continue to maintain within the organization. As I mentioned at the beginning, we have three earlier stage projects, ISKIT, Three Aces, and 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 snow snowstorm in Nevada, any one of which can be a company maker. And we're now actively exploring all three of those. I mean, clearly the addition of East Mitchell has a big positive impact on the project's economics to the point where I believe that we now have a project uh, that's got to be sought after by the big companies in terms of a transaction. We have stated for years that our, our expectation for KSM is to bring in a major mining company that has a technical, financial, and social wherewithal to develop a project the scale of KSM. Uh, we're engaged with most of those companies that would be on that list through confidentiality agreements. We have received a number of proposals over the years from a group of these companies or individually, either acting as syndicate players or um, on their own. Uh, our view is we only get to do this once, uh, and it's got to be with the right partner on the right terms. Uh, what I will say as a result of this updated study and also the industry's lack of new reserves and new production, uh, that we probably have never seen a better environment for us to get a deal done. And uh, dialogue will continue on that and with the expectation that a joint venture will eventually get done. Our goal in a joint venture is to hang on anywhere between 30 to 49% of this project. We will have to give up control, but for our residual interests, we hope to have um, uh, not having to come up with 30 to 49% of the capital. And we believe that's a deal structure that we can get done. And then finally, I think what I'm most proud about, you know, having been the CEO of this company for almost 23 years now, is how we've managed our, our balance sheet and our capital structure. I mean, after 23 years, we only have 80 million shares outstanding with an asset base uh, of, um, of gold and copper in the ground that's second to none. So, Bruce, that's, uh, that's my presentation. Happy to, um, happy to discuss uh, questions. Thank you, Rudy, and thanks for that great presentation. Um, I think uh, I've got a couple of questions online, but I think uh, you you briefly touched on it, but I, I do know that I think a lot of investors, one of the big questions since you've come out with your most recent PFS study is how does that really, in your view, change the game when talking with majors? And, you know, without obviously saying too much, has it, has, have you noticed since you brought out the study uh, interest from others in re-engaging and beginning to discuss KSM again? Uh, great question, Bruce. So yeah, so obviously it has changed the uh, the landscape considerably. And uh, I'd say right now we're as active as we've ever been in terms of interested parties in a data room, uh, discussing the opportunity with our team. You know, the big change here, I think, is the uh, removing the blockade from the mine plan. We always had previous mine plans that incorporated block caves within the first 10 years of mine life. You need to start developing a block cave to sustain you know, production to the mill. If you look at the universe of major mining companies, there's really only two companies that have successfully block caved at this scale. That would be Newcrest and Freeport McMoran. All the other companies that might be potential partners, the large gold companies and the large copper companies, they've never really block caved successfully before. So it's, it was difficult for them to bring forward a project like KSM that involved uh, a lot of the, um, the go forward um, uh, work on block caving when they've never block caved before. By eliminating the block caves in its entirety, we can now show a mine plan that's open pit only for more than 30 years that any one of these big companies can do as they're doing it around the globe now and their other projects. So that definitely has changed the landscape in addition to obviously the, uh, the improved economics here. One other big impact here is uh, we also reduced the footprint of the project through de-risking. Previously, we had to store 3 billion tons of waste. Our waste has now been reduced by about 800 million tons. So we now can store all of the waste rock on the Mitchell side of the mine plant in one valley versus having to go into a second valley, which obviously involves more footprint and more water management in terms of um, water flow that would come off the waste dumps that, are, would, that would be acid generating. So uh, that is also a, a major improvement to the project from the uh, from the joint venture discussion side. One of the questions off the website that sort of follows on to what you just mentioned, can tailings limit be increased or is that it permanently? And how does that project, uh, how does that project compare with Predium's operations? Uh, well, Predium's operations are tiny. I mean, they're, they're putting, I think, 2,700 2700 tons a day through their mill. We'll be putting, um, uh, 195,000 tons a day through our mills. 
Um, in terms of um, tailings, uh, you're absolutely right. We have 11 billion tons of economic resources, but right now our mine plans only capture 2.3 billion tons because that's where we have permitted. The First Nations we're dealing with are coming to us and say, okay, this is great. We want a mine life that's going to go for 100 years. How do we make that happen? Uh, the updated technical report that will be filed shortly for KSM that includes this new pre-fees will also show what the project looks like after the first 33 years. At that point in time, you would go after the big block caves, Iron Cap and uh, Deep Kerr, and you would actually use uh, some of your big mined out pits as places to store tailings. The best place to put tailings in the future are holes in the ground that you create that don't need to have dams built up on either side like our initial uh, tailings facility does. So rest assured, we're already thinking beyond 33 years, although it's unlikely I'll be alive then. Uh, First Nations love this project because of the multi-generational aspect we have and going beyond just 33 years. So looking at, uh, uh, at Mitchell and uh, Snowfields as, as places that we can deposit future tailings beyond the 2.3 billion tons of tailings we now have approved. And another question on, on the line here, Rudy, and I would tell you, you mentioned it in your presentation, but I actually think it's a good thing to reiterate, uh, given the question and the general view of it. And the question is, has the company already streamed off all of its output? We have not streamed off any output. Uh, we did the deal with Sprott and Terra Teachers. That's a royalty on silver. It doesn't involve the copper or the gold or the molly for that matter. It's on a small portion of revenues going forward. It's not a stream, it's a royalty. We also have a deal in place. Royal Gold actually put $48 million into our treasury years ago at a significant premium to market, which allowed us to advance the project. For that investment, Royal Gold now has an option to buy a royalty on gold and silver, a 1.5% royalty on gold and, sorry, 2% royalty on gold and silver, for which they'd have to pay us $160 million in cash. So we expect that to get exercised at some point, which will go towards uh, capital for the project. So when you look at this project, it's, uh, you know, the uh, the royalties would be 2% on gold and copper and 1.5% uh, on silver, or actually 3.5% on silver because um, um, Royal Gold has that. But let me back that up. No royalties on copper, just the royalties on uh, on, on silver and gold. Okay. No, but that's pretty clear, Rudy. And, and, and to your and I think the answer too is you haven't you haven't you haven't streamed off all of the output. So no, I, think, um, I think I think going forward, Bruce, I think the copper is going to play an important role in terms of how this project does get financed. There's a lot of hungry smelters around the world that are now looking for feed. We can show a project here that has more than 30 years of uh, copper concentrate flow at large quantities. The copper concentrate we're looking at here is about two ounces of gold per ton of concentrate and 24% copper. So it's a very high value concentrate with no impurities in it. There's a lot of smelting companies out there, Asian companies that would like to have this offtake. Uh, and we believe we can use that offtake as a mechanism to fund through a pre-production financing, a good chunk of the capital that's required to build this mine with our joint venture partner. Rudy, the next question, and uh, I think I know the answer, but I'm gonna let you uh, take it. It why was the market's reaction to the PFS not as exciting as I know you think it is? Well, look, I mean, clearly, I think it's very exciting. Uh, I think the market has it. You know, it's well, we're in a market now which is very challenging. Clearly, I mean, every gold stock seems to be making fifty-two week lows every day of the of, of the week. Uh, we have a huge disconnect right now between the gold price and gold equities. Uh, the gold price has actually done okay this year compared to bond prices and equity prices. But gold stocks have traded with equities and even worse than that. I believe until we actually get a pivot from the Fed, either a pivot that people realize that will happen or the actual pivot in terms of their policies, gold stocks and gold has continued to, to, to underperform. It, it's frustrating having this great news out here that's not rewarded in the market. But once that market does turn, uh, watch what happens to our share price. I mean, uh, the, the, I mean, we could not have been more pleased with the results of this updated pre-fees and clearly our share price is not reflecting anywhere near what the value of this asset is. Clearly not. Um, next one is, uh, given the challenging labor markets, are you having any uh, difficulty in filling uh, positions on site or for any of the work that you're doing at KSM now that you've actually ramping 
ramping what you're doing on on the ground? Uh, absolutely, yes. I mean, labor, the market is tight. There's a lot of competition for skilled labor in our industry. Uh, we actually had to go out and hire an HR person for the first time just to make sure that we have enough uh, bodies there to get the work done. Uh, we're in competition with a lot of companies in the region that are looking for skilled labor. What I will say is because I think the uh, scale and the um, and this project is attracting a lot of talent uh, that want to work on a project of the scale, recognizing that it's going to go on for a long time. So I guess it is competitive, but we seem to be doing a good job in terms of holding our own and finding qualified people to fill the slots that we need. Okay. Um, and the, this one here, I, I, I feel you're going to tell me it, it, it caveats on JV partner, but the question is, is what's the timeline on production? Well, the timeline on production, um, depends on when the partner comes in and when they make the construction decision. Once a construction decision happens, so you're looking at, at, at a construction of about five years. So at that point in time, go forward five years till you get your first production. Uh, that's how long it'll take to build all the infrastructure out that's required. Now us doing the site capture activities now with roads and camps um, and uh, tying into the, uh, the power grid, that should help that, you know, you when you look at these big projects, as the big companies then hit the ground running, there always seems to be hiccups in terms of doing that, that beachheading, get, getting access to site. We will actually provide that ahead of time uh, through the joint venture with the work we're doing now and substantially started, which should make the transition into the big project construction a lot easier than it would have been had we not been doing this work ourselves. Agreed. Might have been more costly too with the overhead of some of the big entities out there yeah. doing them. Um, Next question. I mean, Rudy, listen, this was primarily a chat about KSM uh, and you did touch on your other exploration uh, uh, projects out there. Is there any, just for the viewers, is there is there any one of them that you'd be working on this year that you're quite excited for what what you might find either this year or on a, on a, on a follow up season? Yeah, we, we, we are drilling ISCID right now. Uh, we believe there's a number of uh, gold copper porphyry opportunities that we are targeting in this year's programs. In fact, three of them we're targeting. Uh, we're now drilling under the old Bronson Slope resource that came along with that acquisition. In a scar in there, you had a, about 2 million ounces of gold and a half a billion pounds of copper in a, in a resource that, that, that was 43101 compliant. We believe that there's a big porphyry underneath that, that we're now drilling and hopefully make a discovery there this year. And then two other targets there. We're excited about three aces in the Yukon, a project we acquired from uh, Predator Gold in the height of COVID, a very high grade mineralization near surface from historic drilling. Uh, we've now spent the last two years on the ground doing the, um, the field work necessary to identify new targets and to build our geologic concepts for this, uh, for this region. We are now in front of the regulators in the First Nations with a permit application to go in with a large drill program uh, we have received draft permits back on that, and now hopefully we can get the permit finally approved within the next period of time so we can drill there this year. Uh, snowstorm in Nevada, Nevada remains a head scratcher. We still believe the opportunities are real there. Uh, when we bought this project in uh, 2017, we recognized it was going to be a multi-year process to actually make a discovery. Our models there are Getchell style and Twin Creek style, two mines just to the south of us on trend that are part of the uh, Newmont Barrick uh, joint venture. We've now conducted three rounds of drilling there. Uh, we have uh, confirmed that the structures from Twin Creeks and Turquoise Ridge run into snowstorm. Uh, we have confirmed that there's gold in the system. Now, hopefully we can vector into where the higher grade opportunities might be. And we have another program ongoing there as well. Yeah, so we're staying busy on the exploration side. Again, that's, that's what's led to our uh, success in the market in terms of uh, finding gold. As a matter of fact, our team over the past 15 years has found more gold through the drill bit than any other company in the planet, and that includes all the majors. We agree, and that's why I want to make sure I never host a webinar where we don't talk to you about what you're up to, because, you know, lightning strikes when, you never look, when you're not expecting. Agreed. Um, one other question here, sorry, back to KSM. Uh, you're started, you stated your goals for the year, including a JV deal on your terms, given no change in terms, what catalyst is needed to get a deal done and what potential time frame? I think the most important catalyst to get a deal done is competitive tension. Um, you know, in the past, because again, the blockading um, 
it's a chal- it was a challenge project for non-blockading companies to try and get their head around to do a deal. By removing blockading entirely, we now have uh, you know seven or eight companies that have the financial, social, and um, and a technical wherewithal to develop KSM because it's open pit only. I always believe that to get the terms we need to or want to get done on a joint venture, having some real competition versus just dealing with one company or two companies is what will get the terms that we can say yes to. And I do believe that as a result of the changes now at KSM with this new mine plan, that we should be able to create that competitive tension going forward. Follow up to that uh, from that same individual is describe what due diligence time frame looks like once you have interest. I think that's pretty wide and varying, but I'll, I'll leave that to you. Yeah, well, a lot of the companies have been kicking tires on this project for over a decade and continue to kick tires on this project. And we're waiting for this updated study. Uh, you know, due diligence typically requires uh, signing a CA, a confidentiality agreement, giving them access to the data room doing some teaches with their teams and our teams to del- to dig into the data. And then if interested to go out and do a site visit, it's a site visit that's hurt us for the past few years. If we remember Canada essentially shut down to outsiders for almost two years, meaning that the big companies that may have wanted to put boots on the ground were not able to get their people to site because they couldn't get access to Canada without agreeing to quarantine for 14 days before they got to site. That's a non-starter. Now with uh, Canada open again, uh, border open, uh, we are now in the process of looking to schedule some site visits for those companies that still need to get to site to complete their due diligence. So it's an ongoing process. Uh, Some companies don't need to get to site because they've been there. Other companies that are new here as a result of the new mine plan uh, need to get to site still. And Rudy, I think think that's about all the questions we have. Uh, We've we've run 46 minutes, so we're 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 well into a long, uh, detailed presentation. So I I really want to thank you on behalf of Red Cloud for your time today. I thought it was a really uh, a particularly good moment in time, given your your uh, PFS that came out that we get out and address everybody again. And thanks for for being part of this. Bruce, always a pleasure to to connect with you and uh, look forward to our next one. And in the meantime, if anyone would like uh, further. Um, questions answered that they did not get a chance to to answer ask on this webinar, please don't hesitate to reach out to me by email. My email address is Rudy, R-U-D-I, at seabridgegold.com. Uh, for those of you that have been following the company for years, know that I'm pretty good in terms of getting back to investors and shareholders. So please don't hesitate to reach out. And Bruce, thanks again. Uh, uh, great job on the webin- webinar today and look forward to the next one. Absolutely, Rudy. Terrific. Have a great day, everyone.